Tour Guides of Reddit. What's the worst thing a tourist has ever done under your supervision? Number one, I was at some resort location in Mexico I was invited to, a kind of tourist activity island, and I was invited for the day. I didn't really want to be there, and everything was a million times out of my price range. The one thing I was interested in, a 20-foot cliff jump attraction I was in line for, was surrounded by Cody, which are Mexican raccoons, basically. They kind of act like monkeys and walk on two legs and reach around with their arms. I guess to make humans give them food. Anyway, a young girl was tracking one and pushing up all across the line when she got to a spot where the rope met the ledge, gave it food, and was immediately bitten on the hand. My brother tied his shirt around her wrist. She was bleeding. Bad and walked her to the bottom where they had a safety officer waiting. They had many signs to not feed animals, and even a lifeguard told her to stop. Some people just do not listen. I feel like an age is necessary here, because a young girl could mean like four, or to some people it could mean like fourteen. Fourteen simply too old to do this. Number two, worked at a living history farm museum. I had a kid that was climbing on stuff the whole tour in the farmhouse and trying to get behind the smith in the blacksmith shop during a demo. After the tour, when people are allowed to roam the grounds, I hear his mom screaming and look over to the barn, and this kid has climbed the fence into the field with our longhorn oxen and is trying to poke them with a stick. I walk over and calmly told him to get out of the field before our lazy oxen decide they've had enough. But this jack-off decides to look me in the eyes and smack Ted on the butt with the stick like it's a riding crop. Ted, bless him, just kind of jumps a little and whips his head around with a what-the-hell dude look on his face. But seeing as he's a longhorn, he just wipes the kid out with one of his horns when he turned his head. Kid goes flying into the dirt and is having a meltdown. Mom is freaking out. I'm like, dude, get the hell out of the pen before Ted actually gets mad. So this kid is crying and trying to climb the fence out of the field, and Bill, who has been watching this whole thing, waits until the kid is almost over the fence. Walks up to him and nudges him in the butt with his nose and pushes him off the top of the fence. I did everything I could to keep from laughing. Kid was fine. Ted was fine. But the kid and his mom were promptly kicked out of the museum. Their dad and little sister was allowed to stay because she was well-behaved and was just enjoying petting the goats at the petting zoo. So since the kid had to leave but his sister didn't, there was a temper tantrum in the parking lot that could be heard all the way to the other side of the farm. But the oxen got some extra grain that night, so I guess they won in the end. What an insane parenting L. Have some freaking control over your kid, please. That kid is going to grow up to be a menace if raised like that, and it's not even really going to be his fault. We have a membership for those who like more naughty and interesting stories that aren't advertiser-friendly. Check out the link in the description and join our Amazing Confessions community so you can support the channel. Number 3. Former Whitewater Rafting Guide There's a calmer section of the river people can, if they choose to, hop out and swim through. They're wearing life jackets so you can just kind of float through it. This woman decides she wants to try it and hops out. After she pops up, she slowly tilts forward until just the back of her jacket is out of the water, and she's completely still. After five or so seconds of this, I start to realize this might not be intentional, and paddle over and physically pick her head up above the water, followed by her gasping for air. I haul her in the boat and ask her what happened. She said she didn't know what to do as she had never been submerged in water before. 1. Why are you on a whitewater rafting trip? 2. Why didn't your strategy involve moving your body? This is incredible. How old is this woman? Number 4. This is very important because 20 to 25 make a lot of noise, which makes wild animals run away or hide. It's even worse if they're wearing shiny stuff they can spot from afar. Okay, so this woman complains, decides to wear shiny earrings anyway. Cousin tells her to get rid of them or she ain't coming with the group, so she obeys and puts them on later. Some species of monkeys in that area love shiny stuff. They ripped the earrings from her ears. Number five, I work at a brewery tap room and take people on brewery tours. During fermentation, CO2 is produced, and the excess comes out through a runoff pipe and into a water bucket. One of the attendees, who was being a pain and trying to be funny, but no one was laughing, asked me what the pipe was for, so I gladly explained. He then asked what would happen if he breathed it in. In disbelief of his stupidity, I told him that he would pass out, slash damage his brain. He then proceeded to grab the pipe and take a breath. He was then ejected and barred, 
Some people are just beyond belief. Okay, unrelated, I know, but am I, am I saying this word right? It doesn't sound like I'm saying a word. Brewery, brew, brewer, brewery. Anyway, story four. My cousin is a tourist guide and biologist. Most of his tours are in Africa. He instructed his group of 20 to 25 people, including kids, not to wear any type of earring or collars, especially shiny stuff, since they were about to go into a thick forest to try to see a bunch of animals. Number six. We're pretty good at stopping tourists from doing too much damage. After being in the industry for a while, you can get a spidey sense for when people are going to do dumb things and can often steer them away from doing anything too bad. That being said, here's one of my favorite stories to tell. I was seven months pregnant, and it was the week before I went on maternity leave. I was driving out to one of our sites, and to get there, I had to drive on the road, of course, through our penguin colony. This particular species of penguins burrows underground and stays hidden in their burrow during the day, and they come out at night when birds of prey and other potential predators have gone to sleep. As I'm driving out to the site, I realize the parking lot up ahead is full, and people have started parking up and down the road, and that's when I see a giant SUV pull off the road, drive between the bollards and into the penguin colony. I pull over as what seems like 20 non-English-speaking tourists start to pile out of the vehicle and take selfies with the ocean backdrop. Staying as calm as possible and using sign language, I point out the no-entry signs of the bollards they drove past, as well as the burrows. They've just collapsed and inform them they may have unalived penguins. Oh, and to get their frickin' vehicle out of the frickin' colony. Once I got them out of there, I started digging out the collapsed burrows to check for penguins. The first four were luckily empty, but the last one had a breeding pair. I get the girl out, check her over for injuries, and having nowhere else to put her, I follow protocol and tuck her under my left arm against my side. I get the boy out and put him in the same position on the right side and start to check him over. Remember how I said I was pregnant? Well, normally you hold a penguin down low, almost on your hip. But because of my round tummy, I was holding him more at the bottom of my rib cage. So when I turned my head to start my health check, the bastard reached up and grabbed my top lip with his beak and ripped straight through the middle. It was about this time that the tourists walking along the road realized this ranger was holding onto two penguins. I had five or six tourists sprint through the colony towards me and start snapping pictures while at the same time potentially collapsing more burrows. If any internet sleuths stumble upon a picture of a heavily pregnant, pissed-off-looking ranger holding two penguins with blood pouring down her face, let me know. I've been wanting that picture to show up for three years and haven't found it yet. Happy ending. I chased away the photographers popped the two uninjured penguins in a nearby unoccupied burrow, and radioed for backup to help with the parking situation. My lip healed without a scar, and both penguins left the following morning for a well-deserved day in the ocean. I feel like no entry signs are pretty universal. Even if these tourists were tourists who didn't speak English, it should be pretty clear. I feel like any tourist, though always feel, well, not any tourist, but like any tourist. Can feel entitled. Every now and then you see those tourists in your hometown or whatever that are, just like, I don't know, they're walking around like they own the place or something. I don't know, it's weird. I'll never understand that sense of entitlement people get. Number seven, technically not a tourist guide, but I was doing a tour of our production facility for some people from head office. As we got to one of the pallet outfeeds, I mentioned the light curtain, which was a safety feature that stopped the conveyors once the light was broken. And so, for some damn reason, one of the ladies decides to stick her hand through the light to test it, stopping the production line and also risking her safety by doing so in the first place. I asked her to not do that again and went about resetting the machine to start it up. No more. Then three seconds after doing that, she stuck her hand through the curtain, again, stopping everything. She looked at me with the stupidest expression on her face and I basically said, what the hell? To this day, I don't know why she did it or what her deal was. I always wonder how these people make it through life at all. Like, what are you do? You were specifically told to not do something, and then you do it. Like, great work. Amazing. Number eight. I'm in the middle of talking and someone's phone rings. Okay, that happens. Usually they just cancel the call or step outside. Nope. This guy answers the call and starts talking on the phone only a few meters from where I'm standing. 
I think, oh, okay, he'll quickly explain he's busy and end the call. Nope. He starts a conversation. The rest of the group glare at him, and I'm put in an awkward position because my workplace puts a huge emphasis on politeness. So I suggest to him to continue his call in the hallway just outside of the room we were in. To which he replied, no, I'm fine here. And went back to his phone conversation. I'm doing my best to talk to the rest of the group, about 25 people, but he is so loud. Eventually, this Chinese woman yells across the room at him, Shut up! We want to listen to a lady, not you. Which worked, but I just couldn't imagine the nerve to ruin everyone's experience like that, because you're too selfish to talk on the phone outside. Also, the place I worked allowed photos, but had a strict no photos of the staff rule for privacy reasons. I also explained this at the start, and 99% of the people were cool. One day, I had a particularly happy snapper who got right up in a staff member's face to take a photo, like I'm talking centimeters from his face. The staffer was just some rando middle-aged white dude, so I'm not sure why the fascination, but he was a livid. It's like I saw it happen in slow motion, so I couldn't do anything to stop it. That guy was removed from the tour. I am a little afraid to know what my Asian woman sounded like. I tried not to lean too hard into the accent, because despite being Chinese myself, it still feels weird to me. But I think by not leaning into it, I somehow made it weirder or worse. So, uh, sorry. If you've made it this far in the video, hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It helps the channel grow. Number nine, I was giving a tour of my university to the mother of a potential student. She tried to recruit me into a popular pyramid scheme. And then when I tried to change the subject by asking what she did in her spare time, she told me about her conspiracy theories that she gives public talks on. They included the dangers of Wi-Fi, 5G, and chemtrails. Oh, and that the moon landings were faked by Stanley Kubrick, who was shortly thereafter assassinated by the CIA and replaced by a clone. I cut the tour short. Felt pretty sorry for her daughter, who appeared to think these theories were reasonable, and had also been recruited into her mother's pyramid scheme at 17. Number 10. I used to work at a heritage site. It was an old military installation with a lot of remaining original structures, bunk beds, cafeteria equipment, computers, etc. Every day it was a constant effort to remind people, red kids, not to jump on the beds, not to slam doors open, not to punch every button like it owes them money. The absolute worst was a group of kids on a school trip. Within the first ten minutes we're walking through the tech portion of the exhibit, where we had a wall lined with Burroughs' large system machines, B5000 as away, all behind this little fence about waist high. I turned to demonstrate some of the pieces, and when I look back at the group, one of them had jumped over the barrier, opened one of the units, and started pulling out handfuls of digital tape from the reels inside. I just about jumped on the kid when their teacher did just that. She jumped the barrier, smacked the kid's hand, and took him outside. I immediately ended the tour and had them all refunded, as I couldn't imagine what else could happen. And all of a sudden, just like that, I understand why chaperones were needed for field trips. Number 11. During my summers in college, I worked as a raft guide on a whitewater river in the southeast. It wasn't a difficult job. The two biggest things we were responsible for was running our trips in a timely manner and ensuring that guests in our boat had a fun and safe trip down the river. The safety part is important, because people visiting the river frequently forget it is a natural wilderness feature and carries all of the associated risks. We frequently received questions about whether the rafts were on tracks, whether I actually had to do anything in the back, and, my personal favorite, whether the river went in a circle and we would end back up where we started. This last question was particularly funny because we took a bus from the rafting outpost to the put-in of the river. Why bother if we were going in a circle? One summer afternoon, I had a boat with three groups of two people. One of those groups was a mother and son. The mother seemed nice, if timid, as did the son, however, as I was going through the routine of explaining the safety concerns and paddle commands, it started to dawn on me that he was not very bright. There was nothing wrong with him, he was just dumb as bricks. Once we were on the river, he almost immediately developed a habit of checking the depth of the water with his paddle. He would incessantly plunge the blade into the water without care nor concern for his surroundings and circumstances. The water on this river is pristine. 
almost crystal clear. The riverbed is visible almost constantly. And still, this young man felt the need to verify the veracity of his own eyeballs by shoving his paddle into the river like some sort of deranged perpetual motion machine. Of course, I warned him against his actions. At first, my concerns were that his depth checking interferes with his ability to follow my commands and paddle. Eventually, however, my pleading grew more desperate, as it dawned on me that this child paid no deference to my authority. He answered only to chaos. It finally came to a head when in a portion of the river that was extremely shallow, probably no more than a foot deep, he plunged his paddle into the riverbed with a force that shook the surrounding countryside. Like Excalibur, the paddle wedged itself among the rocks perfectly erect. The boy, with a staid iron grip that could only be wielded by someone incredibly dense, kept his hand on the paddle as the rushing water carried us away from its new location. In one swift motion, he was wrenched from the raft and landed in a foot of water. He wore a face of bewildered idiocy. It was quite satisfying to keep his paddle in the back with me for the remainder of the trip, after I returned him safely to the raft. All he could do was stare wistfully at the riverbed, his poo brain longing to verify its depth. I don't know if this makes me a bad person, but I do think it is hilarious to refer to a child as incredibly dumb when they're doing incredibly dumb things at least. Just OP went crazy hard on this child. And it's just funny for some reason, I don't know why. Maybe other people think he's too harsh. And hey, maybe he is, but it's kind of funny. Number 12. Not a tour guide, but I guess you could say I work in the tourism industry. I work ground crew for a company that does helicopter tours. Number one rule for customers is, don't walk under the tail boom. The rotor will unalive you and it will hurt. It's unbelievable how many people have a death wish out there. People see the fastest way to the other side of the helicopter and don't stop to think, oh hey, that spinning blade may or may not slice my whole frickin' head off. Let's see how close we can get to it. Number 13. On an open-topped tour bus in London, woman tries to dangle her toddler over the railing, then starts saying she's going to complain to my manager when I told her to stop. Caught her doing it again, and company policy said that anyone endangering their kids like that was to be removed from the tour. So the driver had to come up and march her off. She still insisted she did nothing wrong, like she literally had the kid's feet on the side railing of the moving bus and was just holding him loosely around the waist, one low-hanging tree branch of which there were many on the route, and that kid was gone. Number 14. I used to give naturalist boat trips through a coastal area in Florida. Very slow, see dolphins, learn history, see lots of birds and learn about them, horseshoe crabs, island ecology, etc. I would usually start as we left the dock by talking about some of these small commercial fishing boats there and how they worked. Then onto the history of the area. By this time, people would typically be asking questions. One nice young couple said nothing. Other than saying hello when they got on the boat, and they were the only ones on the boat, they said nothing. I had no idea what to do. Did they hate it? Did they love it? Should I keep talking? Should I shut up? I was sweating bullets, so I more or less talked for the first hour. Not constantly, but some. And for the second hour, I didn't say a word. I figured if they wanted to say something or ask a question, they would. The only sound for that last hour was the low hum of the boat engine and the occasional loud bird. At the dock, they thanked me and gave me a tip and walked away. To this day, I still can't figure out what was going on. But it was my most memorable time as a guide. Now, I'm just saying I feel like this is kind of me, though, because if I were on a tour like that, I just wouldn't know what to say. Do I ask questions or I don't know? What questions would I ask? I don't want to sound stupid. I'd be a little too self-conscious with myself and... I don't know, worrying about looking dumb that I might just not ask anything. So, I kind of feel this. On the other hand, I do see how it is very awkward for the person running it, though. Number 15. Tour guide at my university. I led a tour with a very overbearing father and his quiet daughter, among four other people. As I led the tour, I tried my best to gear the information towards the students' interests and chosen programs to make sure they got the most information. In the middle of my tour, I referred to the daughter's program and the dad just blew up, yelling at me that his daughter is underage and it's unprofessional that I hit on her on the tour. He asked to speak to my supervisor, who helped me explain to him that I'm gay 
and I have had a boyfriend for almost a year at that point. Number 16. I was on a tour with my family in Cambodia, and we visited Angkor Wat. Now, as everyone knows, Angkor Wat is teeming with tourists day and night. There was a long line to climb the topmost tower, wherein the steps are very steep. It was a hot day, and when it was almost our turn, a middle-aged man took two steps, fell backwards, and started having a seizure. People came to his help immediately. However, one man, who was also crowding around him, did nothing but pull out his cell phone and start recording. Thankfully, everyone noticed and started yelling at the guy to put that away. He acted like the victim, though, and said he was just trying to help. What a jerk. I want to know the thought process here. How would this video of someone having a seizure help in any way at all? I just don't understand. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and click the link in the description to join our community. You can check out this video on your screen in the meantime, and I will see you in the next one.